Hello, I'm Matt Parker. I'm Steve Mould. I'm Helen Arney, and you are listening to a podcast of Unnecessary Detail. So far, you've heard three people chatting, so podcast confirmed. And we will very shortly confirm the presence of some of Unnecessary Detail. <laughs> That's right. In this episode, I'll be talking about a supposedly fake helicopter on Mars. I'll be discussing the 1995 release of Doom for the Super Nintendo. And I have a song about the man, the myth, the mathematician. It's not Matt Parker. It's Archimedes. Oh, Yeah, disappointing <laughs> for Matt. But statistically no. speaking, <laughs> most mathematicians aren't you. I do feel like a rounding error. So let's get on with some detail. Steve, you've got some real facts about a fake helicopter. <laughs> no, wait. The the helicopter is real. <laughs> oh, well, I remain to be convinced. I'm just asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a helicopter called Ingenuity. Are you familiar with this helicopter? Not at all. It's the no, one on no. Mars. You know, there's a helicopter on Mars. Oh, right. <laughs> that helps. <laughs> okay. They put a helicopter on Mars, and it's been there for quite a while now. It was meant to do five test flights. It was a proof of concept. Can we clarify? The helicopter did not fly to Mars. <laughs> the helicopter <laughs> was flown to Mars, and then the helicopter flew about on Mars. Can I also ask another question, clarifying question? Yep. It's not like a full-size helicopter like, you know, an Apache. It's a bit smaller, right? It's about half a metre tall. So maybe you could call it a drone. Yeah. <laughs> maybe. A big drone, small helicopter. It's a drone with good marketing. <laughs> it's an amazing achievement to have a flight on another planet. We have flown a thing on another planet. They're saying it's the first aircraft to conduct a powered and controlled extraterrestrial flight. It's like the word controlled is very important in that Ooh, sentence. Oh, yeah. Because what about the lunar ascent module? Maybe the flight has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Because the lunar ascent module left the moon and didn't come back <laughs> to the moon, maybe that doesn't count. I think some aviation people would have opinions about whether or not rocket launches count as flights. I mean, they're still controlled, aren't they? You give little adjustments to them. There must be a school of thought where aviators are like, this is aviation. It's not rocket science. <laughs> yeah, there's definitely going to be people saying that. But it's an achievement because, well, for lots of reasons, but because there's hardly any atmosphere on Mars. So flying is difficult because you need an atmosphere. It's only slightly helped by the lower gravity on Mars. So the fact there's lower gravity makes it easier to fly, but the fact there's hardly any atmosphere makes it much, much harder. So it, it has to spin those blades you know real fast to for it to work like a helicopter works by the blade spinning at an angle that pushes air like particles like fluid air down and that creates lift to push it up i'm gonna say yes the only caveat is there is lots of argument online and offline about how lift is generated by wings and aerofoils and blades and things like that but essentially yes air is pushed downwards and every action has an equal opposite reaction so the module is pushed upwards it's not rocket science though is it it's not rocket science it's, it, yeah i mean and, and, i mean genuinely rocket science is easier to explain in the sense that you know you shove something out the back <laughs> and so you're pushed forwards <laughs> i can see where the aviation people are coming right? from when they're like it's not rocket science because it's not <laughs> It's not. All right. This is all making so much more sense to me now. Thank yeah. you. So it was meant to perform five test flights. It did those really well. It went on to perform a further 67 flights. A lot of flights. So uh, it did incredibly well. The idea is that it could perform reconnaissance. So the other flights were like, yeah, let's test some reconnaissance. Let's fly around, take pictures. The very last picture, that, well, that we've seen anyway, sent from NASA, is a picture taken of the ground i mean that's that's all the ingenuity ever takes pictures of is the surface of mars <laughs> but um it was landed it was on the ground and it took a picture of the ground and you could see the ingenuity's own shadow and it was the shadow of a blade and the tip is snapped off so in the final flight it landed oh. badly and the tip has snapped so that's the end oh. 72 flights in total and yeah. so it just yeah. can't fly or yeah. it can't be controlled. 
or something. And because it saw its shadow, it now is going to be another six weeks till spring. <laughs> That's right. No, because he saw his shadow, you're now going to live the same day over and over again until you find true love I, or something. I, it's <laughs> something like that. <laughs> on Mars, which would actually be a much more interesting science story. <laughs> if Groundhog Day happened on Mars, I'd be like, here for that. And each day is a slightly different length. So, you know. Oh, yeah. It's a good reimagining. Oh. Yeah. It would make Mac Damon's job a lot easier if he could just repeat the same day over and over again. He would learn a lot about potatoes very, very quickly. <laughs> but let's go back to one of the first pictures taken by Ingenuity. And again, it was a picture of its shadow. I guess it likes to take pictures of its own shadow. But some conspiracy theorists took the picture as evidence of Ingenuity being fake. And that's because a shadow is supposed to be all black, right? Like if you look at your own shadow, you don't see that your arms and legs are a lighter shade of grey than the rest of your body. But for ingenuity, the shadow of the arms and legs are significantly lighter. And when I say arms and legs, I mean the blades. <laughs> the blades are a lighter colour in the shadow. If we're, if we're following the Groundhog Day analogy, it's like surely it's paws and... A, a snout? I don't know. <laughs> I'm not sure why that would lead some people to think that it's fake. <laughs> like NASA is amazing at faking all these incredible things. But the person in charge of making these images thought, you know what? I'll make the shadows of the blades a bit lighter. But <laughs> I, I mean, I struggle with conspiracy theory logic anyway. I don't want to drag us away from the yeah. point, but is there consensus on where the conspiracy edge is? Like, is the conspiracy, yes, we sent the spacecraft to Mars, but just the helicopter was fake. Oh. Is the conspiracy we didn't send anything to Mars? Is the conspiracy there is no Mars? I haven't spent enough time in that community <laughs> uh, to know. Right. And uh, I don't intend to <laughs> either. I support the limitations on your research here, Steve. Thank you. From what you're saying, it feels very much like you're implying you have spent long enough in that community. <laughs> I have spent... no intention of spending any longer. <laughs> exactly. Either that or I'm in the pocket of big helicopter. No, uh, small helicopter. It's only half sorry, a Sorry, I'm in the pocket of <laughs> big space. Yeah. <laughs> big space, small helicopter. The small helicopter, yeah. Any ideas why the blades might be lighter colour in the, in the shadow? They're reflecting some light. Ooh. They're on an angle, reflecting light down. Mm. I'm surprised I got any traction for that, I'll be honest, because I thought that was ludicrous. But. <laughs> the, light would, the light reflects off the blades onto the ground would spread out quite a lot, I would have thought. Yeah. It would be amazing okay. if they just sort of lined up with the blades perfectly on the ground. The blades aren't super yeah. shiny, parabola shaped, anything like that? No. Okay. Are they like the late 1990s release of the iMac in that they're slightly translucent? Ooh. Yeah, no, they're not see-through at all, no. Oh. I'm just trying to think different. I mean, is it is it the rotation? Is it like the fact that they're moving means that some light gets through, but yeah. is it to do with the shutter speed of the helicopter's angle? Oh, it better not be rolling shutter. Do you know what? If it's rolling shutter, I'm leaving this podcast right now. <laughs> it's not rolling shutter. This I'll is a, it's it's a global shutter camera, so it's definitely not rolling shutter. Okay, what's the difference between a rolling shutter and a global shutter? I'm leaving. <laughs> though interestingly it's kind of to do with a roll in some sense but a global shutter basically it takes a picture from the whole sensor simultaneously but a rolling shutter it scans down the sensor so that if things are moving side to side they end up looking wobbly that's a jellification we should have seen in videos because most digital cameras are rolling shutter but scientific instruments tend to use global shutter including this one also like um it's made from like loads of off the shelf all the sensors are off the shelf parts that you find in mobile phones instead of these like custom built things by nasa so they're insanely cheap and you know industry has been miniaturizing these things for for years and years and years and they just work it turns out the answer is to do with how the shutter works on the camera. This is according to Sam Damico, who worked on that module. So it's a near-infrared camera. Just like any digital camera, each pixel is like a bucket that's gathering charge every time a photon lands in it. Now, it looks like that picture was taken with a shutter speed of about a thousandth of a second. In other words, the shutter is open and the sensor is collecting photons for just 
one thousandth of a second. That's an estimate based on the fact that we know how fast the blades spin, and we can see that there isn't really much motion blur. So the shutter speed needs to be pretty fast. Yeah, like you were saying,、uh, Helen, you would expect some motion blur if if that's the issue, if that's why it's lighter. So it's not to do with motion blur. Ah,、oh, it's not a blurry blade like spreading out and not quite getting the color right. It's actually capturing. It's a nice sharp edge、wow. to the blade. Yeah, and those blades are going、yeah. super fast because you said there's not as much atmosphere. So that is. That's incredible. Yeah, so it's a really fast shutter on this camera to be able to see the blades sharply like that while they're spinning so fast. So here's the thing: the camera doesn't actually have a shutter. It doesn't have a physical barrier that comes down in front of the sensor. Instead, each of those pixels switches off. It says, "Right, that's enough now. Any new photons that come in, I'm going to ignore them. You've had your millisecond. I'm not going to gather any more charge. No more thanks. I'm full. No more. I'm full. I'm done." And then a short time later, all the pixels are then read out. So the camera looks at how much charge each pixel has gathered, and that tells it how bright that pixel should be. But that happens a, a little bit after, like a few milliseconds after the shutter, the shutter in inverted commas closes. A little bit after, in other words, all those pixels have turned off. The charge is then. Read out from the pixels, but that's a few milliseconds later, maybe ten milliseconds or more. Is it like when you're in a pub and the pub can be closed because, like, the door is shut? Yes, and you're like, you can't even get in there. But the pub can also be closed because you're in the pub. The door's open, but they're like, we're not serving anymore. We're done.、Yes. I mean, it's a great analogy. I'm just not sure it was needed.、Um, <laughs> Does this pub have like a rolling shutter at the front? Because <laughs> it's got a rolling <laughs> shutter. Yes,、yeah. some pubs have a global. That's what you're、door. trying to avoid. So the, it is actually quite、yeah. a good analogy because yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so the helicopters, photographic sensors are inside the pub that is just not open. Yes, and a pub with a rolling shutter. If you're on a bender, you get knocked out of alignment. Yeah. Okay. That's good. Yeah. Okay. This analogy is closed. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm no. The analogy is still open. I can work with this. <laughs> <laughs> so the door of the pub is closed, <laughs> right? But there is a dog door cut into the bottom. Oh, <laughs>、right? love it. In other words, most people or photons they see the door and they go, "Oh, the pub's closed," and they walk away. But some. Quite determined people see the dog door and they think I can get through that, so they crawl through and they're in the pub.、Right. <laughs> so it, that's perfect. <laughs> so there are dogs in the pub now because I think what's actually happening is clearer than the analogy. Let's go back to that. <laughs> <laughs> the, <laughs> so the 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 sensor is turned off, right? It's no longer turning photons into electrons. Except that that's not perfect. It does actually still take some of those photons in and gather more charge, just a little bit. But it's enough to brighten the pixels where the blades were in the first millisecond, because in the next several milliseconds or so, the blades mostly aren't casting a shadow at that point, but the pixels are still gathering a tiny bit of charge. So everything else is just exposing more of the same, exactly. And the only thing that's exposing difference are where the blades, where the blades were. were. That's nice.、Yeah. The partner to that, there will be a slightly darker section where the blades are in the milliseconds after the photo was taken, but that must be almost undetectable. Yeah. So in the several milliseconds after the shutter has closed, in inverted commas. That those blades would have probably done several revolutions, so the whole、oh, thing、wow. smeared out anyway, right? And so you're getting the average of the blades in the ground. To go back to the rolling shutter thing, it's not a rolling shutter, but that readout sweeps down the sensor, so the pixels at the top of the image are read out first, and and then the ones at the bottom. So the pixels at the bottom have more time to gather those extra. Little bits of charge. So if you look at the image, you see that the blades are brighter than the body, but you also see that the blades at the bottom are 
a little bit brighter than the blades at the top because the pixels at the top have had less right. time to gather that extra light. Oh, amazing. You are skirting so close to rolling shutter <laughs> right now. <laughs> so you're a group of dogs and you've arranged to meet in a pub. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and the majority the dogs of you are different sizes. <laughs> you're all different. Majority of you get there on time, and you're recorded in a sequence after you arrive. Yeah. But the longer it takes to record the dogs that are there, there are more straggly dogs arriving at the end who didn't get the memo about. Well, time. it's more like Whatever. you've got a grid of pubs. Each pub is a pixel. The people and dogs in the pubs ah. at the top of the grid are kicked out earlier, so those pu pubs have less time to gather more stray dogs. And by the way, because this is happening on Mars, all the dogs are called Rover. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I want to take my name off this analogy. <laughs> what, the Parker analogy? What are you talking about? <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> We've got all the pubs with yep. slightly different closing times. Yes. And we've got the pups that go into the pubs with yeah. the different closing times and they're all called Rover. No, wait. All the closing times are the same, but the police officers that go round to make sure everyone's kicked out of the pubs, they have to go around the grid and they do it in order. From Work across to town. Amazing. Yeah. The licensing officers are in this analogy now. I love it. <laughs> it's actually the Paw Patrol, but go on. <laughs> Chase is on the case. What? That's all I'm saying. No, it's a helicopter, so it's Sky. Look, okay. You gotta okay. be specific, Steve. This is a oh, well this done. is a podcast of unnecessary detail. We're gonna get the <laughs> helicopter dog or nothing. On the tiny chance that hasn't cleared it up for everyone, I will say on YouTube, Captain Disillusion just did an excellent video about full frame and rolling read oh, and all sorts of stuff with incredible visualization. So I I can highly recommend that video to supplement. The mental yeah. picture we've painted here today. If it's needed. If, if it's needed. Yeah. And if you go to that video and comment about... Not <laughs> enough dogs. Love this video, That's not enough dogs. That would make us very happy. <laughs> okay. Okay, I think we need to wrap this up. Um, <laughs> yeah, so there you go. It's not fake. So the Ingenuity helicopter is definitely real. Good. And it's done amazing things. And it's now... Is it instantly a relic? It's interesting, isn't it? Like oh. it's an, it's going to become an ancient artifact that will be discovered, hopefully, mm. by humans. Ingenuity, the, the fossil. Yeah. yeah. But it's got a bit of the Wright brothers' first controlled flight on Earth. Like they put a bit of the canvas from. Ooh. What? Th that the, the first aircraft that we flew on Earth is like stuck oh, under the soil. Metafossil. So now it's a nested yeah, artifact. It. So they have That's to take nice. a small bit of it. And put that on <laughs> the first controlled flight the next one. outside the solar system. And then we just cascade up. <laughs> or maybe the first flight back from Mars. Because there's Ooh. never been a flight back from Mars, has well, there? Not from the surface, anyway. Where did they put this bit of the Wright Brothers plane? Because if they put it on the wing, like, I'm afraid that's probably the bit that fell off. So maybe... <laughs> oh, it's not the bit that <laughs> maybe fell off. Maybe it's yeah, not such yeah. a good I'm idea. I'm not sure that was a good idea. <laughs> Matt, you hold a world record, don't you? I do. I Well, I used to have the world record for Space Invaders on the Atari PAL edition for the Atari <laughs> 2800. That's so specific. <laughs> so neat. <laughs> yeah. A lot of my career is just getting more and more niche until yeah. I'm You're the best. best. <laughs> <laughs> I can see why those aviators are like, for a certain definition of flight on Mars, so we true. have achieved the only one. That's basically how you think all the time. My motto is, if you define a sport specifically enough, we can all be Michael Jordan. <laughs> <laughs> but you've been thinking about a different computer game this time. I have. I have. I've been thinking about the 1995 release of Doom. Of One of the most influential video games ever. Kind of kicked off, wasn't the first first-person shooter, but really kicked off the whole genre of first-person shooter video games in 3D, which is very exciting. Mm. And actually, do either of you know what the the biggest kind of legacy influence of Doom is in terms of technology today? Um, oh. Is it to do with rendering things quickly? No. Good guess, though. Hitboxes. What's a hitbox? Hitbox. Oh, like like collision detection. 
Yeah, like if you if you did define, uh, you know, uh, a good game has tight hitboxes, which means that you know you can't just shoot. If a bullet goes under someone's arm, it shouldn't kill them, right? But but in Doom, it probably would <laughs> because they just define <laughs> oh, a box around the sprite that that kills pretty them. rectangular. <laughs> yeah, and this some of the um kind of collision hitboxes are what speedrunners will utilize to glitch through walls and all that kind of stuff. It's yeah. a lot of fun. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um so it's not it's not about like ray tracing or anything like that. It's or... Not ray tracing. It's about physics modeling, modeling the physics. It's not physics modeling. Okay. It's people's obsession to get doom running on ridiculous hardware. Oh yeah. Right. <laughs> so it's actually nothing to do with the game at all. Yeah, no, not at all. But now the cliche is can it run doom? So you and I have both had that comment on videos that we've made. So when I made a water computer, everyone commented, can it run Doom? The Domino computer I did over yeah. a decade ago, can it mm-hmm. run Doom? <laughs> Matchbox computer? Hey, can it run Doom? Can it run yeah. Doom? It cannot run Doom. But <laughs> no. It's not Turing Complete, is it, that one? <laughs> you, well, you could machine learn Doom in a menace, non-electrical machine learning device recently someone ran doom on like a a biological system no well okay so 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 the definition for run doom sometimes is just show the opening splash screen Ah, okay and people got a biological system to form an image and they picked the doom image because it's very funny to say yeah that these cells were running doom that's amazing. So you can look at the history of computing f- and assess it through the medium of, can it run Doom? Can it run Doom? Babbage's difference engine, can it run Doom? Oh, that could run Doom. Really? It? No, no. no. I'm sure what? it could. No. Over a period it had to be of bigger. years? Oh, be, you need more of, the, more of them. <laughs> I'm <laughs> sure you, the analytical <laughs> en- engine was pure incomplete. <laughs> I think you would need more brass and steel than there is in the world. <laughs> to... Oh, yeah. If you're going to put physical constraints on it, then yes. <laughs> oh, is that not the point of this? Sorry. No. Well, I'm... okay. <laughs> okay, I'll take it back. The point that there's two things. Can it run Doom? Yeah. And has it run Doom? And should oh, you yes. run Doom? <laughs> I'm going to add that in there. <laughs> Shoot. Uh, I don't know. Let's not pull that thread. <laughs> so a lot of nerds put a lot of effort into making things run Doom. Oh, you may even remember we had... I'm pretty sure it was Andrew Taylor came to an evening of unnecessary detail because they had hacked their Roomba. Oh, yeah. And then they got the Roomba to play Doom live on stage. That's it's amazing. Very funny if things can play Doom. Just to give me a sense of the parameters, like has anyone run Doom on a graphical calculator, for example? The TI-84 has run Doom. Wow. Really? That's amazing. Okay. The Zune. The Zune can the run Zune? Doom. The Zune? Yeah. Okay, I need you to lay it out for me because I this is not a world I'm familiar with. But, right, you're talking about running Doom on a thing, a computer. What are the requirements? Can you list me the requirements of what it takes to, like, inverted commas, run Doom? That's a good point. So, if we go back to the original Doom in the year, it was 1993. Jurassic Park. Well, was that 93? Anyway. <laughs> Producer Laura is nodding. It was 93. Amazing. The unnecessary detail is real. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) And vague at the minute. So, (laughs) Doom is released for computers, but you need a reasonably powerful computer to run it because some of the first, like, 3D rendered graphics, and before that, like, Wolfenstein 3D, things like that were, like, 2.5D. Oh, I think even maybe Doom was a bit 2.5D because you've kind of got 2D sprites trying to move in a 3D world. But you need a reasonably powerful computer to run it because it's doing things in 3D. It claimed you could run it on a 386, but don't believe that. You'd need a decent amount of computing power to render the 3D world of Doom. Doom was then a very popular game. And so lots of people who didn't have a powerful computer want to play Doom. So suddenly other devices or other systems are... And this was not for hilarious reasons. This is just for capitalism reasons want to be able to run doom because they're going to sell a lot of copies of doom oh right that wasn't a problem for the original playstation that came out in 95 because it had an onboard chip well it was a co-processor in the main processor but there was a whole separate 
bit just for doing the complicated mathematics required to do 3D graphics. And they would then be passed to the GPU that would then add all the textures and stuff. So anything that could do 3D graphics could run Doom. But then some of the systems that couldn't do 3D graphics still wanted to run Doom. And that includes the Super Nintendo. So the Uh Super Nintendo did not have a 3D graphics card. You could put a extra chip in the cartridge. So for people who don't remember the old days of video games, you'd have a physical chunk of plastic with a board inside it, and you'd have to shove that into the top of your console. And normally it just had data, but you could be very clever and put an extra chip in there to help do some of the mathematics. We will provide imagery in the show notes for anyone unfamiliar with 90s computing. the way back times. (laughs) That's amazing, isn't it, to think that that was going on. People were making games, but they were including a little bit of computational power in the thing. Yeah, it's crazy, isn't it? But it worked because you're shipping a physical item with the game code on it. Why not put... I mean, it puts the price up, but you could put something in there. And you know what? It's worth remembering how amazing this was at all. Because for a long time, these sorts of calculations, like all the trigonometry required to do this sort of 3D like geometry was super difficult to do. Because trig functions, which I love, and humans have been using for millennia, are a real pain to calculate the values of. Let's say you want the value, the sine of an angle. And you know, well, how do I how do I actually get the value of the sine of an angle without like drawing and measuring a triangle is not going to cut it. You start with the value of the angle, you get the angle in radians, you subtract that value cubed divided by three factorial, and then you add the angle to the power of five divided by five factorial, and then you subtract the angle to the power of 7 divided by 7 factorial. And then you've got to alternate adding and subtracting the odd powers of the angle divided by that odd number factorial. And and these are difficult calculations to do by hand. That goes on forever. That sequence goes goes on on forever. forever. But each term gets less and less. So you, you decide how many decimal places you need. And then you do as many terms as required to get to that level of precision. And because this was so annoying to do, no one wanted to do it from scratch when they needed a trig value. So that's where these kind of log tables, like books, that as well as log values would have trigonomic values in them. So you'd have a big solid book Um, and you'd have to look up the angle in the book and then read off what its sign value was. I'm uh, calculating exactly how many of our listeners will be rewinding this podcast 60 seconds to listen to that explanation again to have another go at it. <laughs> okay, I'm going to see if I can say it back. I'm going to add some a musical accompaniment while you're repeating. Okay. okay. So, if someone wants to calculate the sine, cosine or tangent of an angle, then they have to do this infinitely long calculation which is a sequence of, you know, so if it was like the sine of x, then the sequence is x to the power something divided by something plus x to the power something bigger divided by something bigger minus x to the power something bigger divided by something bigger plus x to the power something bigger divided by something bigger. And this sequence goes on forever. In reality, you don't have to calculate every single term in this infinite series to work out what the sine of x is. You just have to work out the first few, and then you've got the answer to some number of decimal places that you're happy with. And a calculator would stop once the screen is full of, <laughs> of digits. Um, That's pretty good. Yeah? Does that sound the about right? music was nice. I would have been happier if you'd set it in a pub, but the explanation was <laughs> always very good. There's some stray dogs. And they're sitting in a triangular arrangement that forms a right angle. And <laughs> Perfect. Now you're talking. Some of the dogs are acute, so that works. <laughs> okay. The point is, people would pre-calculate these values, write them all down, so then if you needed to use one, you'd just look it up in the book. Finally, we invented computers and calculators, things that could do this automatically. So instead of having to pre-calculate it all, you can just as Steve was saying, do enough terms for the number of digits to fill the screen, and then you're away. 
And that's why we suddenly were able to do like 3D video games because we could crunch these values and calculate all the angles and distances and sizes and everything to render realistic, <laughs> realistic 3D environments in on mid 90s level top end computers. without having to look them up in a book. Basically. Yeah, you pre render it. Amazing. Yeah. So you do it firsthand with the extra computing power. So you could do it with less computing power, but lots yes. more time yes. to do the lookup stuff. You you got that exactly right. And in fact, when they were trying to work out how to put Doom on the SNES, the Super Nintendo, the developer Randy Linden did that. They realized even with the extra chip in the cartridge, it wasn't going to be able to do the calculations that would be normally done on the PC. So what they did was they pre-calculated and saved a bunch of lookup trig tables on the cartridge. The second biggest file on the cartridge. Amazing. Ah, so they did. They did exactly that. They compensated for the less calculating power by putting in like a little lookup book. Did it slow it down? Was it really clunky? Well, looking things up is quick, isn't it? Look up is quick. But the trade-off is hard drive space or storage space. Because doing the calculation doesn't require any data to be shipped with the game. But if you do the table... Uh-huh. You can have a low power processor running it, but now you need a bigger storage uh-huh. thing. So it's a constant trade-off. And surely there's a possibility that you haven't got the number you were looking for or something yeah. can go wrong if if there's a scenario where that they need a calculation because you've done some fruity move that they don't have the answer to. And exactly. then what happens? The whole thing crashes, it just stops, it just skips it. The just resolution do it. would know. be slightly off. But it was running quite low res. Yeah, I suppose it, the issue is like how many what 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 precision of angle do you want to cover? Do you want to cover every angle to three decimal places, in which case the lookup table is going to be large? Or are you happy with just two decimal places? They did five different trig tables are all stored on the cartridge. They had sine, cos, and tan. No surprises there. They also put in arctan, because it's it's handy to go backwards and forwards from gradients to mm. angles. So arctan is super useful. And they also put in sec, which is just upside down cos. Inverse cos. One over cos. You could just pull oh. something from the cosine table and invert it. But that takes computational power. And they realized they were doing that so often, they may as well just also store yeah. all of mm. inverse upside down cos. Just speed it up a little bit. I haven't thought about SEC since I was at university. <laughs> SEC is underrated. And I'm glad I didn't mispronounce that. <laughs> okay. Don't humans think about SEC every 10 seconds? Oh, so I don't. <laughs> uh, well done. <laughs> the biggest file wasn't the game. That was another lookup table. For They hard computed all the conversions from the output of the other calculations to then convert it into pixels. So they just kind of worked out every possible, all the combinations, and then pre-rendered them. Uh, by pre-render, I mean saved the values. So now there's a lookup table for that as well. The third biggest file was another lookup table. Wow. They pre-calculated a bunch of line of sight calculations and put that in. So they're just finding all the difficult calculations and doing as many of them as possible for as much space as they could possibly fit around the actual game itself on the cartridge. So there's stuff we use that relies on log tables now that we don't even realize. Yes. Yeah. Look, look up tables in general. Yes, absolutely. What? What? So when I was writing about this, oh, it's in my book, Love Triangle. We're officially announcing pre-orders on the 29th of February. I thought it was very funny to put it on the, the leap day. Whoop, whoop. This episode comes out before <laughs> then. So if you're listening before the 29th of February, 2024... I imagine I might have accidentally left a link to pre-orders in the show notes. That feels like a thing I might do. Who knows? I, I can't. I can't officially say one way or the other. I mean, it definitely feels like something I would do, but it does. does. Actually, you know, it does. Yeah, nothing to do with you, so, Matt. You get no choice. Good, excellent. <laughs> so I was reading through all this stuff when I was writing my book about trigonometry, and in the year 2020, Randy Linden, who did the conversion to get Doom to run on the Super Nintendo, released the original code, put it up on GitHub. Anyone can go and look at it, which is how we know a lot of this stuff now. 
And so I went and had a look at the lookup tables and they're all stored in its hexadecimal values and all that jazz. So it's not super human readable, but you can go and see these lookup tables now, which is, it's a bit like visiting a helicopter on Mars, but you can do it now. (laughs) So I went through and looked at them all. I thought, you know what? It's one thing to read something and think you understand it. But doing it is also very helpful. Mm. So I thought I would see if I could also generate the tables. I did that, and they didn't match. That's weird. Randy wrote the original code that generated the tables that then went on the cartridge in C. I was using terrible Python code. I was like, oh, it's probably my terrible Python code. So I dig into how I was doing it, and I'm like, oh, wait a minute. And I kind of forensically reverse engineer how Randy must have done it. And I'm like, I think they made a mistake in the way they were handling the rounding because some of the values were rounded the wrong way. I was like, oh, wait, they're truncating instead of rounding. Mm. So I email Randy, and I can confirm two things now. (laughs) Number one, I am the first and potentially only person who's emailed Randy to ask about the mathematics behind Doom running on the Super Nintendo. (laughs) (laughs) And secondly, yes, he checked. He sent me a link to his original C code, which is also on GitHub, for how they generated those tables. And he confirmed, yes, they were rounding them the wrong way. I <laughs> I genuinely found. Wow. And I'm going to use mistake or error. It's a choice. A choice. Choice. Because Randy worked out the extra line of code that would have to go into the original code to fix this. So it is one more line of code. Uh. But this is not the code that goes on the cartridge. This is the code you use in advance. So one extra line probably doesn't matter because this is all being pre-rendered. They did point out, however, and I'd like to quote them, that the error isn't noticeable considering the resolution of the game. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I think that both confirms there was an error Yeah, and points out that it doesn't matter. I'm surprised you didn't just reply saying this version of Doom is no longer supported. <laughs> <laughs> Also, it's on GitHub, mate. Why didn't you just make a pull request? You could have. You could have. I should have. <laughs> just change I'm not, it. I'm not that good at coding, mate. As soon as Randy had put this on GitHub, all the code, people went through it, and they're like, "Wow, it was a bit annoying that you couldn't rotate Doom Guy, the character, while strafing, like going side to side." And so they worked out a, a patch to bring <laughs> ro- rotating while strafing to Doom. So it's not, you know. People are still fixing this stuff. Yeah. Okay. So I, I should submit should submit a pull request. Yeah. To fix the rounding. <laughs> Amazing. That's the kind of mistake I like to find. Interesting yeah. but inconsequential. So, <laughs> to quote the rest of the email from Randy, after pointing out it doesn't matter, Randy says, but like all programs, there is room for improvement. So you want to oh, oh, very nice. Like everyone, like all of us. Yeah. That's a nice moment. Do you know what, if humans ever do retrieve the Ingenuity helicopter, I hope they try and get Doom running on it. <laughs> <laughs> How do we know it's not in the code already? <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> this episode is sponsored by Brilliant.org. Here's something I figured out about my weird career. It's really important that I'm always making incremental improvements. Because I make podcasts and videos about STEM subjects, a big part of that incremental improvement is just learning more science or maths or engineering. And the way my brain works is I need to find hacks to get myself doing that. One hack that always works incredibly well for me is finding ways to make it fun. And Brilliant.org does that perfectly. Like, I used to play lots of puzzle games, but now I just play Brilliant.org instead, which is possible, by the way, because it works on mobile as well as desktop. It gives my brain the same amount of dopamine, but now I'm also learning about coding or data visualization or quantum computing or whatever. The fact that the courses are so interactive doesn't just make them more fun. It also makes it so that you're actually going to retain what you've learned. If you're the type of person who likes listening to a podcast of unnecessary detail, it's likely that you have a technical job that requires incremental improvement to stay ahead. Why not make it fun with Brilliant.org? Get started now with a 30-day free trial. And if you love it and want to upgrade to annual premium membership, the first 200 unnecessary detail listeners will get 20% off. Follow the link in the show notes or visit our special URL, brilliant.org forward slash A-P-O-U-D. 
So, Helen, what great moment in science history have you brought for us? <laughs> You're competing with a very small, not very good helicopter. Yeah. <laughs> and a video game that didn't run very well. Okay. <laughs> well, you know what? I've been doing a lot of research for the shows that I'm writing, which are quite a lot of them are about unsung women from science history. So I thought I'd do something a little bit different this episode and would instead bring a song that I wrote some time ago about an oversung man from science history. <laughs> oh, about time. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, give the boys a chance, guys. And the reason I've done it up is because I, I recently was working on a show with the BBC National Orchestra of Wales, which at some point may be going out on BBC Six Music, we've no idea, about Archimedes. You cannot underestimate Archimedes' contribution to mathematics and science. Ancient Greek mathematician came up with the most extraordinary theories and ideas and explanations for physical and mathematical ideas that cover all sorts of different topics from engineering to like pure maths to physics, like amazing contribution to the sciences. And yet he is constantly overestimated <laughs> in the stories that get told about him, right? You think he had enough to his name without needing to embellish it over the centuries. He squared the circle. He invented ways of <laughs> pushing water uphill. <laughs> He defended the city of Syracuse from attack for decades. One of his best mates was like the king and he was his advisor. Like, I mean, the, the guy is phenomenal already. He's so phenomenal that when Syracuse finally was invaded, the invading Roman general put up a monument to Archimedes. Wow. Oh. The scientist who had kept him out of the defended city of Syracuse for so long because he was that impressed by what he did. And yet, <laughs> like, so many bits of myth have accreted to this person. It's like, you, you get some good stuff to your name and suddenly everyone is throwing every possible extra bonus amazing thing at you. It's possible, but unlikely, that he ran naked through the streets of Syracuse yeah. because he was sitting in his bath. He saw the water level rise. He thought, this is how I'm going to solve this question about buoyancy. He did come up with these incredible theories about buoyancy, like he came up with the entire concept of how things float. He did some incredible equation work on that. But it's very unlikely that he did it while sitting in his bath and then ran down the street naked. But that's such a good story. It's such a good story. Do we know the origin of the word Eureka? He just shouted a random word according to the myth. I thought it was a pre-existing Greek phrase, meaning I found it. So it doesn't mean... I'm naked, or, or, or it <laughs> it's not Greek for God. I'm cold. Yeah, <laughs> or yeah, yeah, yeah. It's Greek for no photos. <laughs> Is, <laughs> can someone look it up? Yeah. Like I. <laughs> oh, so it turns out I don't know how to spell Eureka. Oh, <laughs> uh, double O R E E. No, what does it mean? Oh, it it comes from the ancient Greek word meaning I have found brackets it. Oh. Yeah. And next to it is a picture of a man in a bath. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. It's impossible to escape. So much of what Archimedes did is in letters to his like colleagues and friends at the time, but so much of what people now think of as Archimedes did was written like 300 years later, 600 years later, like, hundreds of years later, people went, Oh, look, there's all these amazing stories about the ancient Greeks, but we're not totally sure they happened or who did them. So let's just give them all to Archimedes because yeah. everyone loves Archimedes already. And, That's you know, he can, we can just load all of the capacity for myth making onto this one person. So, you know. They're the null island of legend. Yes. <laughs> the gravitational pull of Archimedes pulls in all, all the legends. He probably didn't invent like a solar panel death ray out of a parabola that focused the what heat of the sun would? to explode a ship some miles away. Probably didn't do that. He definitely wasn't the first one to invent the Archimedes screw. Did he lift a ship out of the water using a massive lever? I mean, it seems outrageous, but then also some of the things he actually really did that we do know about seem completely outrageous and seem impossible. Like, there's a thing called the claw, which is this... A machine lever thing that used to 
smash ships into pieces when they try to invade in the harbour. Like, it, it, something like it might have existed, but it probably wasn't as effective as all of the stories say. But the fear of it was, because there's this whole story about how, like, when a ship coming into the harbour saw, like, a little bit of a rope emerging over the top of the barricades, they went... Oh, we better leave, guys. The claws here. Claws so the, here. Just the fear of the claw, <laughs> the contemporary fear of the claw, is enough. Next time, gadget. Maybe part of the reason he became famous for all these things was for sort of propaganda reasons. Yeah, you know. I mean, <laughs> they've got Archimedes. <laughs> He's invented another thing. You the know? military would make things up <laughs> to advance their cause. Who, who am I to say what really happened? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of science historians who will tell you what happened. The song that I've written is part of a whole show I wrote a long time ago, never quite finished, called The Time Travelling Coffee Shop, in which I take loads of these science myths, things that didn't quite happen as people love to s tell the story now, like Archimedes jumping out of his bath saying, oh, I've discovered buoyancy and running down the street naked. Stories like that and others like Schrodinger and his childhood obsession with feline pets and their sad demise. Like there were a lot of things like that. So it's kind of taking all of these fictional stories that are rooted in real science and putting them into a time traveling coffee shop which, again, is something that doesn't exist. But if it was a time-travelling coffee shop, it would explain why their lattes are so expensive. So it, <laughs> it actually made quite a lot of logical sense at the time. So I'm going to do that song and we're going to try and do it live while I've got a cold, which is going to be fun as well. But there is one thing that as I was doing all of this amazing research on Archimedes, there are so many things that he did do that were just extraordinary. And one of them that I've never really investigated before, never really thought about, never really felt like I'd actually got locked into my head, was his approximation for pi or one of his approximations for pi and this is really interesting because matt you approximated pi yourself by hand do you want to tell us a little bit about that <laughs> well i have a tradition of calculating pi for pi day and every second year i do something by hand this time i thought i'd see how many digits it's even possible to do and so i got 400 volunteers to come and do long division <laughs> i mean f for a week people came and went like everyone wasn't there for the whole week it you know i didn't lock these people in a room this was voluntary long division and we did ten thousand pages of long division to try and calculate pi by hand and i can confirm it's very difficult yeah you know when steve so accurately recapped the infinite series for sign we were calculating the equivalent infinite series for, for arctan, for the inverse tan, the backwards tan. I was there for the last day and... Yeah, you saw the end. I saw the end and it's unbelievable how much excitement there was for one person slowly reading out a number. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because we had to verify it at the end. People were on like... their feet. It was amazing. <laughs> ah, digit by digit. Yeah. The room was electric. In 300 years' time, they will take this hand pie calculation and frame it as 400 people running naked down a street or something. It will, it, <laughs> like, it's, it's exactly so what true. I'm talking about. Like, it sound, what you've done sounds so ludicrous already that an extra bit of ludicrous Good point. when someone talks about it in 300 years won't really go amiss. It'll be like, sure, fine, no worries. Until now, I didn't realize it's a good point. I haven't gone on the record to say I wasn't naked at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I did run a bit and yell a little, so I can see how that might. Yeah. I'm you know. thinking about going on record to say you were naked at the time. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all want that. We all appreciate. Finally, a first-hand contemporary account. Yeah. Your abuse of being a primary source, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, you calculated with the help of about 400 people, like an, a series of yes. calculations that eventually ended up with an approximation a of big pi. Big series that approaches pi. I'm dancing around saying how successful we were because the video mm -hmm. isn't out yet. So okay. if people want to wait until the Monday before pi day, which I think is like the mm -hmm. 11th of March, the video mm -hmm. will be on the Stand Up Mass YouTube channel. You'll be able to see Steve expressed no opinions about other circle constants. <laughs> you'll be able to see 
First of all, how many digits we calculated, and then how many of those were correct. And confirm whether or not I was wearing appropriate attire. So, like, that sounds like a, a total mess. And oh, my I, goodness. I yes. want to try and describe to you Archimedes' approximation of pi, because I hadn't really looked at it until I had to do this research for this Archimedes show. And it's just amazingly elegant. And I just think it's a really beautiful thing to visualise as well. Okay, so first up, why was he trying to get an approximation for Pi? Not for views on his niche maths YouTube channel, I will tell you that for nothing. Uh, It's because no one had actually got a handle on the actual true value of Pi at that point. Like, he was holding back mathematics in a way that I think is quite hard to get your head around nowadays because we all know pi. We know what it means. We know what it implies. We know what to use it for. We know what it's like. Like, that it goes on forever without repeating. You can't describe it as a simple fraction. That it's so fundamental to our universe that it it pops up in all sorts of unexpected, weird equations in maths and physics that don't seem to involve circles at all. And the ancient and Greeks, they just didn't know any of that, but they knew pi was important and they wanted to work out its exact value f- for reals. And yes, you can and they could get a pretty good practical value for pi by drawing a circle, using a tape measure or something like that, because pi is basically the circumference of a circle divided by its diameter. So you draw a circle, you measure the circumference, you measure the diameter, you divide one by the other, and you've got a pretty reasonable version of pi that you can use for construction, engineering, general day-to-day usage. But that wasn't good enough for mathematicians like Archimedes. They wanted the actual number, not something that was like good enough. They wanted to achieve it using geometry and arithmetic, not by falling back on anything crass like a tape measure, which is so practical and real worldy. Okay, Archimedes got a circle. So then what Archimedes did is put a triangle inside the circle like so exactly like snugly fit a triangle snugly fit inside your circle because you can calculate the lengths of the sides straight lines of a triangle yeah. right easy straight easy. lines easy. Easy. easy easy peasy pythagoras had a few words about it yep. you can work it all out it's easy so then you take the triangle right and then you double the number of sides so you turn it into a hexagon And then that fits a bit more snugly. And yet you can still calculate the lengths of each side and add up the length of all six sides using not just numbers instead of using measurements. And you're like, oh, I've got something that's a little bit closer to the circumference of a circle. That's good. So then you double it, double the hexagon to get a dodecagon. So 12. 12 12-sided shape. And then you double it again to get an icosatetragon. 24 which is 24 sides. So it's starting to get really snug, like yeah. really snug on that circle. And you double it again to get 48 sides. Matt, do you know what that is? That's a 48 <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's Yeah, okay. I only know because I've got it written down, mate. It's a tetracon to octagon. <laughs> ah. In contemporary language, it's 48 gone, whatever. Then you double it one more time to get 96 edges. And that is super duper snug and is an N.A. a conta hexagon. Come on. And it's basically indistinguishable from a circle. Depends where you're standing. A 96 sided <laughs> shape. <laughs> it's snugly fitting inside a circle. You can calculate all of those little tiny lengths and get a number that is just under the circumference of the circle. And you can get it by arithmetic means instead of by measuring it with a tape measure, right? Very clever. She's pretty smart. So there you go. You've got a calculated number for the circumference of the circle. You've got a calculated number for the diameter because you're using that all the time to work out how big this NA conta hexagon is. And that should give you a value of pi. And that's kind of smart. And you know that pi then is going to be slightly under the real value of pi because the NA conta hexagon is slightly smaller than the circle. And most people would be like, that'll do. Good enough. We'll leave it there. Pretty close. Archimedes didn't stop there. He did exactly the same thing again, but with a triangle on the outside of the circle. So you get the three-sided shape on the outside and it's massive, right? It's enormous, but you can still calculate the size of the edges, of the, t- the length of the edges of the triangle. And then you do the same thing. You make it a hexagon, it gets a bit smaller. You make it a decagon, it gets a bit smaller. You make it into this 96-sided shape. And then what you've got is like this 
this 96-sided shape just outside the real circle and one just inside the real circle. And if you do your calculations then, you've worked out the lowest bound for pi and the highest bound for pi. Pi has to be somewhere in you've between. You've, it. Yeah, you've caught it. Yeah. You've caught it inside Sandwiched. two 96 sided shapes. And for me, that is like a beautiful piece of ingenuity and thought process. All right. And this was so powerful. It managed to get the value for pi was somewhere between three and 10 seventieths. And three and ten seventy once. Oh, ten, right, what, what are those as numbers? Steve, Steve's on the case. He's crunching the numbers. So three point one four two eight yep. ten seventy once. Did you say? So three and ten seventieths and three and ten seventy once. <laughs> Easy for you to say. <laughs> yeah, you say any a hexagon then, Steve. <laughs> three point one four zero eight. That one goes. So yeah, three point one four. That's great. So you got it to two decimal places. So 3.14 is locked in. Yeah. I have a question, though. So the idea is that he's able to calculate the the length of these straight edges, right? But is he having to use trigonometry to do that? In which case, does he come up against this thing we've already talked about, right? Which is he has to do that infinite sequence to calculate it. Did, Did they know about that infinite sequence of powers to calculate sine and cosine? If not, what were they doing? They did not. Though they were doing straight up old school geometry, oh. Pythagoras level geometry to work out. So there's a way to do it without using trigonometry. Yeah, because you don't have to do all 96 edges. Do you just got to do one. Yeah. So you imagine the, the piece of pizza coming out from the center of the circle. Yeah. But it's a triangle because you got at the end, it's the flat yes. edge. So you got this, and you know the angle in the middle because it's 196th of a circle. Mm-hmm. And you know you you got one. And then I, you can Pythagoras your way to the the length of the other wow. end. Is my very hand wavy okay. understanding. Right. I imagine if I'm wrong, I'll be corrected pretty. Okay. <laughs> and just to confirm, he's, he's not doing measurements. He's not. He's not taking out a ruler. He's not drawing. Nothing it. measured. No. Or theoretical. No. That's no. That, That's the whole point. We mm. do have evidence of trig table equivalence going back. Okay you know, thousands of years. So, and it's a bit murky what you call trig and what you don't. Mm. But that kind of idea of these values are, that you can convert angles into to use have been around for a long time. As far as I'm aware, they weren't using the infinite series at that point. How lovely is that to work out pi from like fixing up a couple of triangles? Gorgeous. Well, shall I try doing this song? I do have a horrific cold and I, I haven't actually practiced this song for about 12 years so we're going to give it this is exciting then good old go there we go right the scenario is I'm a barista with my time travelling coffee machine and one of my regular customers comes in what can I get you today Mr A the usual a tall skinny latte can I tempt you with muffins or cakes? You seem rather cold. Oh, you're starting to shake. Oh, now I see what you've done. You've come out again without putting your clothes on. Keep your trousers on, Archimedes. Keep your trousers on, Archimedes. You came here, you called it Eureka, but you're here every day, and that makes you a streaker. Dripping bath water onto my shoes, scaring my customers with your review. I don't care what you discovered, please keep your genitals covered. Keep your trousers on, Archimedes. Trousers on, Archimedes. You'll never find Pythagoras in him bearing his naked ass. Please have a little class. Our front windows are glass. Keep your trousers on, Archimedes. Keep your 
trousers on Archimedes. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> Flawless first time after 12 years. Oh, nailed it. Well, that's it for now. We're all off to find a pub that's both closed and dog friendly. <laughs> and, <laughs> and before we do that, I don't know if we have yet mentioned that this podcast is part of the ACAST Creator Network. And um, if we haven't, we mention that yet. I'm sure one, one day, one day we will. We'll get in somehow. If you want more details than we've provided on this podcast so far, uh, you need to check out the show notes that are linked in the episode description. Uh, they're also available at festivalofthespokennerd.com slash podcast. We've put loads of stuff, pictures, links, stuff, songs. You can find out more about Matt's new book steve's new videos and i've recorded a special version of the archimedes song with all the right notes in the right order <laughs> wow we've just announced a bunch of new live shows in london in bristol and online with another of our regular live stream shows from the royal institution for more details go to festival of the spoken nerd.com or if you don't want to have to go anywhere just join our mailing list We'll send you all the information about our latest shows direct to your inbox. We're also on, I think, pretty much every social media network, even the ones that change names. They can't shake us off. We're there. Look up Festival of the Spoken Nerd and we'll let you know what's happening near you. And if you want to get in touch with any unnecessary detail of your own, podcast at festivalofthespokennerd.com is our email. Come and find us. Say hi. That's it. All right. See you all next, next time. time. Bye. Bye. More Bye. detail. Bye. We're closed. Our podcast of unnecessary detail is made by Festival of the Spoken Nerd. That's Helen Arney, Steve Mould, and me, Matt Parker. This episode was produced by Laura Grimshaw. Our theme music is by Howard Carter. And what we're most proud of in the world is being part of the ACAST Creator Network. Thank you for listening. <laughs>